to present the data, and we found that every time we had to do another report or we were called in to work on something like that, we had to do it again. And we thought there must be an easier way than to run all this data again and run all the analysis. So uh, that began a process of work using Excel, and that's what we want to present to you today. How we took with no uh, federal funding, we know we're not a Title V grant, we don't have any of that, we're just two professors who started working. Uh, in a project, and the project began at a very small scale. It's become a big project. Uh, at the present time, we started out with uh, support of the chancellor in 2007, who gave us a small office space, a computer, and said, well, try. And since then, chancellors have supported our work, and our current chancellor has been supporting us as well as the Vice Presidency of Academic Affairs of the University. Uh, we started out with one campus, Fajardo, and from then on, at the present time, we are giving the system we have developed to eight of the nine campuses of the Inter-American System of Puerto Rico, that is the, one of the private institutions of higher education on the island. Our idea started, we started out more talking about informed decision making, and at present, we have developed a strategy to develop software for academic analytics. And what we want is informed decision making, to provide and help people make informed decision makings. And the focus is on retention and graduation of students. Okay. As I said before, we're not a big project. We're not funded. We don't have... We don't have any spe specific, we, we don't, we're not an office. We don't have uh, real backing. We have the backing of our chancellor in terms of release time, compensation. We have the backing of the Vice Presidency of Academic Affairs in terms of uh, funding and release time. We come from two different academic fields. And we have divided, we basically, when we started looking at the project, because this is an empirical growth project, it was nothing planned. It just grew and grew from the work we were doing. Um, we are doing institutional research of data warehoused, and we want to understand the patterns related to what students' performance once they get into the university and other characteristics of these students. And we were interested, and we're both very interested, in the integration of technological tools into higher education and finding out how student information can provide us information uh, since the previous project had indicated that this information was useful for determining per student performance, subsequent student performance, how other uses of the information warehoused at the university was will be using. So we're two faculty members. We have release time, we still teach, we still do all the committee works. I just did the self-study for the campus uh, for the accreditation last year. Uh, he works other projects. So we're not dedicated personnel doing this work. And on top of that, we have a programmer, and that's our secret weapon, as we call him. He's a student, he is on contract, part-time contract, uh, funded by the Vice Presidency of Academic Affairs. But he's a wonderful person who can take our dreams of analysis and turn them into Excel worksheets using Visual Basic programming. So what we were, have there is two things. We, want, we were interested in getting this information. We were interested in replicating research on student data. And we were also looking for a way that every time that we had to do it again, we don't have to go back to SPSS and run this thing. All we have to do is input the data, and he was able to program that for us. So we were able to integrate subsequent changes in patterns in the analysis, and we were able to start constructing models once we got newly admitted cohorts, and we were able to track those cohorts throughout the time they've been studying. And the other important part of this is the personnel of the central office of the university, the technological infrastructure, the information technology people, 
who have become our partners. And it was started as an informal collaboration, has become into a formal collaboration where they work with us and they bring us the support that we need. We, don't, we only work with PCs. They're the ones who have the big data warehoused in their facilities. So we want to talk a little, and uh, I'm not used to talking by myself, so I'm... No, vente, vente. I've, we always do things back and forth. Now he's telling me to do it all myself. No. Okay. Well, we have, when we say it was cost effective, is we, don't, we did not start out with funding except for time that was given to us by the institution. And I guess they gave us the time and crossed their fingers that we would get something done. So we have personal computers. What we're using is what we have there. We did not get funding for special software or anything like that. We just use Office and Visual Basic. But we have a strength that we find for the systems. The systems, since 95, adopted Banner, and all the data for all the campuses of the system is warehoused at the central office, is using the same structure. When we've read or gone to meetings, we find that many people have problems getting this approach because they have silos, they have different structures. The database is structured in different manners. But in our case, we had the same structure for all the campuses of the university. So, please, this is your, this is your expertise. No, it's not my expertise. Okay. Uh, the main thing of our project is uh, of our query. The query uh, struck uh, data from our base database, and that is uh, the main goal of our project, because with that data, when we extract that data, we validate the data, and then we put that data in our programs to replicate and some and do also uh, so many analyses we do in our software. But our main focus is the query because the query extracts the data and, and we validate that data through the process with the uh, central office. But that is the key. And then that's the first key. The second key is our program that interpret that data. Well, <clears throat> in the process, and we, we do a lot of research project, uh, very little research project about some particular uh, aspect of the data. And that project that we do, that research we do, we try to replicate in a whole data we have of all campus and all cohort we have to use. We try, we practice with one, just one cohort, and the models, the, the statistic result we try to replicate the program look have to do is also replicate that process um, we have some models we show later some model that we have the the first we see is about that model is uh, we don't think about education we think about other fields something like demographic epidemiological and business analysis and try to put that models in education um, Okay. Um, what led us to the interdisciplinary position was when we started seeing patterns in the data, we realized that like you look at the graph and all of a sudden, like I'm from environmental studies and I said, well, that looks a lot like the graphs I saw when we were doing population studies in population biology. And the same thing, we looked at other things and when we started looking particularly epidemiology, different strategies that are useful in those disciplines, in some ways we found that we could transfer them into the, the process, the research process of this. So at present time, we, uh, the ones that have turned out to be the most useful are the use of the odds ratio strategy. We're uh, using the chi-square uh, net present value of uh, students and uh, probability, probability tree diagrams, uh, using the notion of conditional probability. Given the fact that we have 19 years of data that we can understand and we can analyze, it gave us a tool for seeing what happens if what happens if this, what happens to these people who have these characteristics, and follow and track them throughout time. Uh, what we do is, when we run, we've run a lot of models. We, we've spent a lot of time doing cluster analysis. That got us nowhere. We 
you know, gave up on that, wasn't giving us anything really valuable, and some of them do, some of them don't. When we find something that really goes, that we find that it's telling us something, we go ahead and call in the programmer, and he starts modeling it so that we can then replicate it to other cohorts, to other campuses. Uh, so we start out on a small scale, finding out if is there a pattern in the data, or if I apply this model, what would happen with the data, and then we transfer it to other levels. And then the programmer works just at the aggregate letter of the cohort or the campus. But we've also been able to segment the data by other variables like academic programs, admission type, or we can now we have been focusing on being able to see what the model does when you deal with the individual student. Okay, at the present we have within the analysis divided by the campuses, we have over 141,000 students. In fall or spring semesters, we have been working on the semesters, and we have the academic variables for all the students. So we have, once a student is admitted to the university, the university assigns him uh, an identifier, enters him into the database of the place where he first enrolled, then we're able to track that students. At present, we can find students who started in 95 who are still enrolled at the university or have come back. We're able to track who leaves, who stays, who comes back. And surprisingly, every semester we run the, uh, the analysis and we find students who enrolled 15, 16, 17 years ago and who have come back to complete their studies. And, and sometimes, surprisingly, there are our students. In one case, uh, I see the name and I re recognize as one of my current students and I went to talk to her, to talk, feel, get a feeling of what happened to her. I already knew by the data that she had been away for like uh, 10 years and this was able to, to really, uh, the data was really accurate to the story that she gave me of what had happened in her life. Uh, the way the uh, pro uh, software is structured is we don't have any pretty fine results. There are analytical structures that go into the data extract that we don't change the data. You can change, you just remove the previous database, you get the new query, you put it into the software, and then you're able to use your menus to select whatever type of analysis you want. That is, if you want a student population, you want the cohort, you want aggregate, and you're also able to do analysis like by gender, by a particular uh, socioeconomic status, different variables that are already within the system. As long as the data is in the system, we're able to use it and run some type of analysis with it. It's called Estudio de Retención y Desempeño Universitario, ERDU, the programmer gave it that name and it's thick. Um, it is in its fifth version. We've been working different menus. At present, we have eight menus and 66 sub-menus. Within those sub-menus, you can also do some of the analysis by different variables. Uh, once a uh, semester starts and uh, registration settles from uh, all those students who are beginning come and go, we extract the data we test the software and then we meet with the campuses and we give them a copy of the software so they can also do the same type of analysis that we're able to do on our campus. Then we meet with the people from the campuses at the Vice Presidency of Academic Affairs. They convene a meeting and we do different uh, sectors of the population. Uh, last year, we did uh, uh, professional counselors. We had professional counselors from the eight campuses of the university uh, meet with us and with one of the counselors of, in our campus who is using our product. She's been working with us closely uh, from early on because her office happened to be right next to us. So she came in and says, what are you doing? We explained to her and she's helped with the last. So she was the person who trained the counselors and how she's using it and how it, how it has helped us. Um, so the idea of our product is to be able to put it in the hands of the people who will use it, and it can be used at different levels, at the aggregate or at the expense. In her case, she deals with the adult education program. So all her, she does, uses the program, but she focuses only on adult education students. Okay, 
Each campus decides what they're going to do with the information. We don't tell them anything. We just tell them, hey, this pattern, you have this pattern, you have this situation, you have these students in this situation. And it is the campus who authorizes people to use the software. And the strength of the software is that since it's only Office and Visual Basic, they can use existing computing technology. So deployment of the software to the campuses did not in involve any special type of expenditure. Well, one campus decided that they're going to give the main person a better computer. But anyway, she had an old computer, so they gave her a better computer than they probably would have bought because she, you know, she want, needed more power. But it does not mean that you have acquiring a software and at the same time you have to acquire all this other infrastructure for the personnel because they're using the infrastructure that commonly any institution will give to an administrative personnel. And since the results of the analysis come out in Excel sheets, they can take this information, copy, paste. And that is very valuable. I just did a, a self-study and believe me, running the thing, getting the graph, copy, and I pasting it into the document where it would get the attributes of the document. So I didn't have to sit there and change the graph or anything because it would, the merging of uh, the compatibility between the software and Office gives you that facility really facilitated a lot. I could, you know, hey, you have, you, I need a graph for this. I could get the graph, copy, paste, and put it into the report. It was a five minute, six minute thing. Many times people, at first, didn't even believe we could do that. And when they saw it, it was like, oh, get me another one. Okay. At the present time, it is uh, a systemic initiative. It appears as one of the tools that the university recommends to all the campuses to be used in order to establish their budget guidelines or for their planning purposes. Okay. So it sounds great when you decided like that, but we're going <laughs> to show you some of the things that I was able to run this last week to illustrate this presentation. What we were interested, so we have such long-term information about student performance, not two or three years, we have 19 years to go and present. What have been the historical retention and graduation patterns? And we have a lot of menus that dedicated to that. We also uh, found that we can do, use the data for interventions. We can program the software so that they can go in, take the information, and create tools for intervention. We're also going to illustrate that. And then that also shows us how to forecast or the trends. And if current conditions continue, what would be the projected trends? Okay. So this is a typical graph of uh, who, are, uh, who have graduated, who have left. And the graph is, uh, can be, modified if you do it only with uh, graduates and dropouts, or if you can do, you can also add those who are still retained. It's the same graph, and you can literally run it on the software, and I copy, paste into the Excel spreadsheet. These are all uh, hypothetical um, demo uh, information. This is not real data. We're also working with academic performance, no, um, satisfactory progress norms that have become such a significant uh, element in terms of federal regulations and financial aid. Um, in this case, we talked this out with our, uh, one of our counselors, and we were using a, a section of students from different programs. This could be run by a program, but with this particular case, we've run it by the adult program. And it shows the students who, by risk in terms of the norms, in terms of the pace of completion, and in terms of GPA. And uh, it brings out a list that can be used by the counselor, indicating who has a lot of risk, who has risk in one particular condition, but it also provides the information of the student that the counselor does not have to go into her records and find out. You already have there what's the email, what's the phone number, what program they're in. You have information about the credits that the student has to approve in, the, in, the, in that program, how many credits they've tried, how many they have uh, currently enrolled. You have a feeling for what their Pell Grant use is. You have their GPA and how their pace of completion. So it gives a snapshot in one line 
of who are the students for that particular group, a subgroup of the population, who need intervention. Okay. So um, in this case, we found um, we're going to be using the first student, who is microbiology. We changed the programs to make sure that nothing is identifiable. And um, we find that the student is at risk, and he's not on probationary status at the current time. And uh, once the counselor has that, she can also run what-if analysis on that student to determine what would that student have to do in order to achieve or go uh, and meet the norms of satisfactory academic progress. So in this case, we find a student who, in terms of GPA, it doesn't matter. He is in big trouble. He's never going to make it 2.0, which is the cutoff point at this particular time. And his pace of completion is very, very low. And at the present time, he would have to approve all the courses he had enrolled in order to meet the norm for satisfactory, which is the last, we don't have a pointer, but it's the last line. And in other, all the other scenarios that we have constructed for him, he is not in good shape. He is a student that really requires immediate intervention and analysis because, and she knows it the minute she runs this, you say, hey, this person, Really, we have to get him, we have to talk to him, we have to intervene with him. We cannot wait. If, he, if he's not taken care of, he's not doing well, he's not going to make it. He's going to fail, and he's not going to be able to enroll. So the program is not only to give you the aggregate picture, but it also gives you, identifies individual students, and then it gives you a, an additional tool for determining if the student is at risk in how are you going to start to provide tools for him to say, hey, you have to approve all your courses, you have to get a B in all your courses, you have to get an A in all your courses. Okay? Okay, you want to do this? Ale. <laughs> okay. Okay, one of the things we were wondering when a lot of things was what happens a long range of students who make it to graduation because this is a big issue at the present time. And this is where we started using the probability tree diagram which we wanted to illustrate to you how a notion of mathematics, which is really a mathematical notion, that's why he's you know, in charge of all this things. I, I dream about, well, what if we found out and I asked the question and then he tries to use uh, the model. So we have uh, this model that has uh, proved to be very, very useful for understanding something that many times we, we feel, and it's what happens to a student that first semester. When we ran, ran the probability diagram, we ran it at the end of the first year, the beginning of, of the, uh, the end of the third semester. But we found that it was very, very, very dramatic that a lot of the students who make it to graduation had one thing in common within our system they had achieved 2.0 that first semester and they had enrolled in the second semester. And the probabilities were high. Over 90% of the students who make it to graduation have those two characteristics. The probability of a student making it to graduation without being achieving 2.0 in the first semester and registering on the second semester is fairly low. Some make it, but not many of them make it. So uh, they talk about commitment to education. I think that we have a certain marker in our system that it is very important that first semester, the first, and the, the interesting thing is when we ran this, we segmented by regular students, by adult students, by transfer students. And the patterns were very, very similar. There seems to be an, there, the event of the experience of that first semester of enrollment at the institution carries a lot of weight on what will happen to the student. We know that from the literature, but we did not know the weight was so high. It was very, very high. If you want to get the student to graduation, you really have to be careful when first semester that he is enrolled at your institution. And uh, we were surprised because in some of the cases, the probability of uh, the students having those two characteristics who made it to graduation was as high as 96%. So 
Uh, that is a lot. Of Only 4% who did not have 2.0 ever made it to graduation. So the academic achievement of a student in that, and their satisfaction with that first year really has a lot of weight in the retention. Okay, so when we said it was cost effective, it's cost effective. We can deploy it to an entire university system. You don't need a, a fully staffed uh, office to run this. We have the programmer, and um, it gives us tools for institutional effectiveness. We know how effective we are because if we achieve changes, the data, the system, when we inter integrate next observations, we should be able to do it. Okay. So we know when we're saying things based on the information we get in there, that we're not talking light. We're talking about 37 semesters. At the present time, we're right now integrating the 38 semesters with uh, the new uh, data that will be used this semester. And so we have a picture of what happened. When we started out, we have been at the university for a long time. We have seen many changes. We have seen many, seen many things that have uh, mod been modified during the time people go, people come, a new model is adopted, you know, a new program. And for us, to our surprise, when we started running the data, we could not believe it. The data was very similar. They were very, were very, the patterns tend to be very, very constant. If you only looked at the data, your conclusion was that nothing ever changed. If you look at the reality of the things that have been going on, you say, well, yeah, but this change and that change, but somehow or other, it's not reflected in the patterns of retention and graduation at the institution for at least for the last like, 19 years. And I guess one of the uh, things that uh, I guess brought to mind is how uh, constant or conservative higher education is, because we tend, we seem to be doing the same thing even when we do don't, we try to do different things. Uh, we don't really impact this measures or the metrics involved. So what we're seeking with this uh, program is to help individuals make informed decision makings with metrics based on their own historical patterns. You know, this thing about benchmark with this and benchmark with whoever, whatever. Hey, benchmark with yourself. Have you really changed? You're, you're saying you're changing. You have to get metrics that show you changed. If you change, Everybody might be very happy, everything might have worked beautifully, but you did, not, you did not change. You're still doing the same thing because the effect on the students, on the retention of the students, on the graduation of the students maintains itself. So the metrics we feel cannot be um, established using others as referent. You have to be using yourself and then you go for the others. But if you don't even know yourself, how are you gonna start changing to try to meet some other external benchmark if you don't know what your own performance has been? And we also uh, find that providing tools for informed interventions at the individual level gives the people who work directly with the student tools and the students tools, because when you show the student, look, this is where you are, this is what will happen if you improve your courses and all that. That is very useful. The counselor says that once she informs the students, sits with them and explains to them what the numbers are, what happens if you get an A, what happens if you don't approve all your courses, it really makes a big difference in the attitude of the students and the commitment. Or at times saying, hey, I cannot make it, you know, this is not for me. But many times, many of them realize that they're not gonna, the university, they're not gonna say, hey, you know, oh, yeah, you keep on going, it's always forever. You know, you really have to, improve your performance if you really want to achieve an academic degree at the university. And the fact that no one has to get exceptional, or you need to be a person allowed to see student information dealing with the student. You don't have to go into a big technological infrastructure. You don't have to have fancy equipment, great servers, and things like that. You need a good, a well-organized database at a central that keeps the data, and then the whole notion of big data, which is coming out nowadays, is usually, you know, you, you hear about all these big tools, but even a simple tool like Excel, if you use it and you find patterns, you can program Excel and give a person with a PC in their office the capability of doing the work. And at present time, we know, we, we know that once we have it that way, it can easily be exported 
you know, to be used, you know, what if calculators and cell phones or web-based tools. So what we feel is that uh, if an institution is committed to planning and evaluation, um, they can use a tool like Edu to really uh, provide everyone the ability to understand uh, information relevant to the decision making at their own level and to inform planning and interventions, be them at the group level or at the individual level. So once we've talked about that, we want, uh, and that's what Nicolas is going to do, and he's going to do it in Spanish, so he's very happy. Okay. He's going to show you Erdo with uh, at work. Uh, como habló la doctora, aquí presentamos, es más fácil para mí en español que en inglés, a uh, los ocho menús que ella mencionó, que tiene el programa. El primero es el, el enfoque tradicional de retención, que es analizar las tasas de retención con distintos aspectos, desde podemos segmentar por las escuelas, saber cómo qué escuelas realmente me están graduando, se están graduando los estudiantes, qué escuelas no se están graduando en los estudiantes, cuáles persisten, cuáles son las tasas de graduación. Todos los análisis que nosotros tenemos ahora mismo lo hacemos a 12 años, los por usar los seis años de la BKP ahora, ya que nos impusieron eso, pues entonces todos los análisis se, basados en los seis años como el principal objeto, pero no necesariamente se limitan a eso. El análisis se hace por 19 años, ahora vamos a hacer un análisis por 19 años cuando analizamos las cortes de agosto del 95. Uh, cada menú tiene distintas opciones con sus subopciones. Aquí miramos desempeño universitario, lo que tenemos ahora a ver es cuando ellos, su desempeño, cómo se asocia con la retención y con la graduación, esta otra opción es de intervenciones, que fue una de las que mencionamos, la cual me genera la, li la lista que usted vio al principio, pues me genera la lista y me identifica, mire, tales estudiantes ahora mismo que están matriculados en la universidad muestran riesgo en di estos distintos aspectos. Por ejemplo, una que nosotros corremos, esta simple, vamos a buscar corte, usted coge cualquier corte, lo que va a hacer es buscar los estudiantes de esa corte que están activos en el semestre que usted está corriendo, en otras palabras, cuando lo corramos ahora en este año, pues los que estén activos en este semestre de enero. Y lo que voy a hacer es que vamos a asumir que va a obtener 2.0 como promedio en su GPA durante el semestre y que estoy seleccionando a todos los estudiantes, incluyo regular, avance, transferido y estudiantes a distancia. Ah, eso me identifica estudiante y me hace proyecciones e, y me indica que por ejemplo el estudiante tal va a obtener un promedio de 1.43 y me va a decir en qué programa está, si está en probatoria, cuántos créditos ha aprobado, cuántos créditos ha intentado y yo con esa información simplemente lo que tengo que hacer es tomar este numerito, copiarlo y vuelvo otra vez al menú y aquí le digo ok, como estoy, en el, los, que no era. como estoy aquí, quiero, yo quiero verte desde otra perspectiva. Yo quiero verte la bus de este estudiante y ver lo que ahorita usted vio, que era la planilla de intervenciones para saber cuáles son las perspectivas que tiene ese estudiante, cómo se ha comportado. Y aquí ya lo tengo reflejado. ¿Qué ha pasado con ese estudiante? Cuando usted ve un texto en rojo, quiere decir que ahí manifiesta riesgo o no cumple con algún parámetro. El ritmo de aprobación no lo cumple, no cumple con el GPA del semestre pasado. Se supone que siempre en todos los semestres nosotros tenemos como regla para que caiga en riesgo es que no obtuvo 2.0. Si obtuvo menos 2.0 está en riesgo. Y el acumulado nos indica siempre cuánto BKP ha utilizado ese estudiante y luego nos muestra cuáles son los posibles escenarios que va a tener ese estudiante a base de que obtenga 1.5 y apruebe 50% de los créditos, 75% de los créditos, etcétera, etcétera. Los criterios del promedio están ajustados al programa, porque hay programas que requieren un GPA mayor, por lo tanto, por ejemplo, el programa de educación que requiere 3.0, pues los análisis se hacen a base de 3.0. Como siempre, otro elemento que se requiere en la beca federal es el PACE, y ahí está indicado. Estos tipos de estudiantes, cuando uno tiene eso, uno dice... El, el otro elemento que vamos a presentar para avanzar es el del análisis 
que se mencionó, que es cuando hacemos el análisis de probabilidad y yo quiero ver qué es lo que ha pasado históricamente. ¿Qué pasa cuando el estudiante en el primer semestre obtiene tal promedio? Claro, yo puedo modificar eso si al segundo semestre, al tercer semestre, al cuarto semestre, yo puedo seguir modificando hasta el décimo semestre. Porque ya el 11 y 12 sería los 6 años, ahí no, no, ya, no, no, ya no hay mucho que hablar. Uno puede seleccionar la corte si es agosto o enero. Usted puede seleccionar los tipos de estudiantes. Si tiene estudiantes adultos, pues se va por avance. Si tiene estudiantes transferidos, si tiene estudiantes a distancia. Y usted puede establecer cuál es el GPA mínimo que usted quiere pedirle a ese estudiante. Vamos a dejar todo fijo, que es el default que nosotros le damos por lo que hemos investigado. Y el programa va a analizarme todos los cortes que tienen al menos 12 semestres. ¿Qué ocurrió en el semestre 12 con ese estudiante? Y me lo va a resumir en una hoja. El demo aquí se analizaron un total de 10.540 estudiantes en ese caso. Recuerde que esto es un demo, esto no es real. Nosotros tenemos este, 27.000 en algunos casos, este, 12.000, depende del recinto. Esto, no es, esto es un demo. Y lo que me está diciendo es, si el estudiante no saca 2.0 en ese primer semestre, ¿a cuántos fueron según el demo? ¿Qué por ciento representa? ¿Qué es la probabilidad? ¿Cuántos de esos se matricularon? ¿Cuántos no se matricularon? Y de esos que no se matricularon, cuando van por el árbol, al final, cuando yo los quiero ver al semestre 12, ¿qué tienen? Pues nada, que no se me graduaron prácticamente ninguno y que representan muy poco. Los que toman el camino del árbol de probabilidad, el buen camino, el buen camino para nosotros quiere decir, sacaste 2.0, te matriculaste en el segundo semestre, ya tú te encaminaste para graduarte. Esa es la característica principal. Okay. Pregunta ahora ya porque... We're going to start with the questions right now. If anyone has a question, they can come up to the front to the microphone, please. I actually have some questions myself. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very interesting... Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to give you the first one, and then I have a few, so I'm going <laughs> to give her a turn. Um, Since you work this with Visual Basic, I was, I was, um, I don't know, I don't, don't understand very much about the uh, the programming part, but I went, I was um, curious if you have an interface um, for web that people could access no, or, no, no, no. okay, so no, they no, people no. they do it through you and then you give them the queries so that they can use the graphics and the information at the different no, campuses or. No, we give the software. Oh, you give the software. Yeah. I think that was not. Each campus has the, uh, their own software version. Okay. On that. Okay. Okay. And um, how easy it is to get the information from Banner and feed the? Uh, no, it's not easy. <laughs> I was. I was. That's the big problem. I was. Uh, uh, yeah. We, we work with the first query about one year. You want to take the microphone okay. here? I'm just. just uh, we worked with the uh, first query about one year to validate the query, and then from that time on, uh, we still change the query, validate the query again, corroborate. Oh, we have. To, Oh, we have uh, five years working with that query. Because that is the heart of the project and in terms of extract the data. The other part of the project is uh, obvious, the program. The analysis. The analysis, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was concerned because I, I used to work a little bit about this in assessment and, and institutional effectiveness at the UPR. And I understand how difficult it is to yeah. uh, make programs, you know, to mm -hmm. try to meet each other and, and work. Um, you have a question, please. This is very impressive. I congratulate you on your Thank work. You. Um, my question, I have two questions. The, the one is uh, when you say that you let administrators use it, or different offices can use the software, um, was there a learning process or do you ever experience that um, people don't really understand all the tables or they, they would uh, choose different parameters and come up with different numbers and then when they talk to each other they kind of um, you know one office thinks this is uh, the fact and another one because that's something that on our campus I'm concerned with a little bit um, how much information can we give um, I work in institutional research and the question is how much uh, data can 
different offices um, handle. Uh, and then my other question is, um, if you have seen that pattern of the first semester being such an important one, um, have there been any interventions uh, coming out of that finding? Thank you. Okay, well. Uh, the first question about uh, about the data, we make it clear that this is research data because the definitions that we use to uh, for developing the query are not the same definitions that have been officially been used by the university before. Uh, so throughout all the campuses are aware that this is presented as research data and we have, because we have particular delimiters about the date we do the query and all that, which do not necessarily coincide with the official data. So people are trained and informed, particularly on the menus that re relevant to their, to their use, uh, but it's not the official data. We, we make it clear it's research data. And the training, we always tell them, make sure you know what you put down on those menus, because if you put something different, you're going to get a very different result. You always have to be aware of what you're doing. Uh, in terms of student intervention, we don't prescribe what people have to do. We just give them the tool. It's up to the offices, the campuses, to decide what they're going to do with it. We are a system, but the system allows each of the units the, the freedom to choose what they will do in those areas. So we really, you know, we know individuals who are using it who talk to us. and. Uh, they use it regularly. The, at the present time, we're splitting the software and we're putting everything that's related to intervention and individuals in one particular module and we're creating a module more for the analysis of the aggregate analysis because they were perturbed when they saw those menus and all those alternatives. They just want the student intervention phase. So we're doing that for this year. This is the, the, the work we have traced for this year. That's Any other questions? Okay, my question was actually related to hers in terms of um, what is the institutional processes, if any, uh, in place when some of the markers start pointing towards, let's say, um, um, problems in uh, um, la parte docente or, or institutional effectiveness and things like that? It's up to them. It's up to them. It's up to them. Yours is the research part. We do okay. A research part. Okay. And develop the software. <laughs> the they tool. can replicate it every time if they want, but okay. we don't establish policy. All right. Um, we have now our break from 3.30 to 4 before the next session, the last session of the day. Um, I thank the two presenters for their intervention. And um, just please stay for our next session in half an hour and take a look at the uh, presentations out outside. Thank you. Okay. Gracias.